rock types and rock formation lab. It's on the heels of the rock cycle lab and the crayon lab. Purpose, the problem, identify several different types of rocks from their characteristics. We're actually going to look at hand samples and a variety of different rocks, looking at their specific characteristics. The idea is that we want to be able to identify the distinguishing characteristics of igneous rocks, the distinguishing characteristics of sedimentary rocks, and the distinguishing characteristics of metamorphic rocks. In addition to that, we're also going to determine the locations of formations of several specific rocks. In other words, if you're out in the field, out in nature, in particular specific locations, you should know what sort of rocks would be typical of finding there. Hypothesis and background. Igneous rocks form from the cooling of what? Lava on the surface or magma underneath. There are two types of igneous rocks. Blank, which form on the surface, that would be outside, so extrusive igneous rocks, and blank, which form deep inside, intrusive igneous rocks. <clears throat> There are several different types of textures for the purposes of this lab. We're going to do four. They are coarse grained, big visible crystals, <clears throat> fine grained, smaller, more microscopic crystals, porphyritic, which is a combination of big visible crystals embedded in a fine grain matrix <clears throat> and glassy, which is no crystals. Geologists can also characterize the chemistry of igneous rocks into three basic categories. It's simplified, but more or less works. These categories are blank, which is rich in heavy metals like iron and magnesium. It gives it a dark color. We call that basaltic. And then there is blank on the other end of the spectrum which is rich in silica, which gives us a lighter colored. That's granitic. And then finally, in between, intermediate, we call that andesitic. So in that explanation, in that background information, you heard me talking a lot about one specific characteristics. One specific characteristic and for igneous rock, the name of the game is crystals. Let's look at sedimentary. Sedimentary rocks form when blank are compacted or cemented together. Sediments. We can classify sedimentary rocks into two main categories. Clastic, sometimes called detrital, and chemical. And it all has to do with how the sediments are deposited in solution. Clastic sedimentary rocks are classified by the size of the sediment grains from microscopic <clears throat> clay sized particles all the way up to large pebbles, cobbles, and boulders. And the other type, chemical sedimentary rocks, are broken down into three categories. These are evaporites, biochemical, and coal. Of all the chemical sedimentary rocks, limestone, probably a rock you've heard of. It's abundant here in North Texas, formed in the ocean. Of all chemical sediment rocks, limestone is by far the most abundant. The sediments are deposited in a oceanic aqueous environment. <clears throat> sediment rocks are also the only type of rocks in which you will find what? Fossils, the preserved remains of prehistoric life. <clears throat> in this explanation, heard me mention the term quite a bit, the main 
distinguishing characteristic of these is the sediments, their size, their arrangement, their distribution, and how they are deposited. Thirdly, metamorphic rocks are rocks that have been changed or altered over time due to great amounts of heat and pressure. We can classify metamorphic rocks into two categories, what and what. From the notes, foliated or non-foliated. These are types of textures. Not the same texture we're talking about up here. Texture up here deals with the size and distribution of the crystals. Texture down here deals with the arrangement and the distribution of similar minerals and whether or not it forms banding. It has to do with what it came from, what the parent rock was. Foliated rocks form when mineral grains align to form a, as I just mentioned, banded appearance. Blank rocks do not have this banding. Non-foliated rocks do not have this banding. Foliation will form if the rock has blank different types of minerals. Several different types of minerals. Multiple different types of minerals. Rocks that only have one type of mineral will be non-foliated. Metamorphic rocks undergo extreme heat and pressure. They can actually completely blank back into magma. Melt. <clears throat> when dealing with metamorphic, the name of the game, the main characteristic that we want to look at is kind of a twofold minerals and whether or not foliation forms due to the heat and pressure. Materials, rock samples and kit, something to sketch and draw with, <clears throat> colored pencils. Examine each rock and draw a colored sketch to the best of your ability. Read the descriptions for all rocks in each rock type. After you've examined each one, after you've sketched each one, then after you've read the descriptions, try and match them up to the written descriptions. Lastly, last part of the lab, which is kind of part two, complete the cross sections by choosing where each type of rock would form. Safety, do not drop any of the rock samples, do not switch the samples, do not peel off any of the paper have numbers, they have labels on them. Lastly, please do not use a pen or a pencil to write or draw on any of the rocks. All right, the first set of rocks are sedimentary rocks. These are rocks where we're looking at the sediment size, sediment distribution, looking at strata and layers. In a minute, we'll look at each of them. Sample zero, sample one, two, three, four, and five. I'm gonna sketch as best we can with detail, with sediments. Remember, we're looking to draw the main characteristic, sketch the main characteristics of sediments in here. After we have them drawn, I'm going to try and match them up. These are our six rock samples. These are not in order. We're going to try and match each one with the best description. I won't read through these on the video here. I'll just list their name. Sandstone, obviously some sort of sand-sized particles to clastic detrital rock, crystalline limestone, or limestone forms in, the, forms in the ocean. Limestone is something that is always going to chemically react and fizz. 
with an acid solution. We have something called a conglomerate. It's a clastic said rock made of rounded particles of varying sizes. We have shale, clastic said rock that forms in areas of very low energy, made up of very tiny, tiny sediment sizes. We have coal, it's a chemical said rock that consists of fossilized and lithified plant remains. It's a fossil fuel and very unique rock called coquina. Try saying that, coquina. It's a very special limestone that is made of cemented together shell fragments. It has a very, very specific look. It looks like a granola bar. Because it's a type of limestone, it will also fizz. So in this lab, we'll look at a variety of different rock types, sedimentary, igneous, and metamorphic. We'll start with sedimentary, give you guys a chance to inspect these and sketch them. We'll start with sample zero. And if we take a closer look at this, see that it's gray, it's not, doesn't have particularly distinguishing characteristics. There does appear to be some sparkly crystals in it. Some very, very small kind of crystalline aspect to it, which may mean that it um, has some sort of um, marine crystalline growth to it in uh, the ocean, or something like that. We don't really see um, any strata, any layers or anything like that, maybe indicating that this was um, formed in a low energy environment, maybe in a muddy area somewhere. I'm gonna do a test here. This is hydrochloric acid. It's very dilute, um, not particularly strong, but hydrochloric acid is something that will react with calcium carbonate and it will fizz, okay? That calcium carbonate is CaCO3, and it's a mineral that we call calcite. And it indeed fizzes, chemical reaction gives off. So it's a great indicator that this is something that's made of calcite. And there's one main type of rock that mainly made of calcite. Let's see if you can figure out what that is. Again, this is sample number zero. Let's look at sample number one. Sample number one does have large sediments in it. Remember, these aren't necessarily crystals, either sediments. And the size of the sediment and the shape of the sediment indicates the energy. So these right here are actually large sediments, ones that you can certainly see. These wouldn't be able to be blown by wind or um, slow water. These would be fast moving water, high energy environments. But you also have smaller sediments in there as well. So this is a, this is a mix, this is a wide variety of different sediments, many of which that are sand grain size, some of which are pebble size. And just to give you an indication, let's put the hydrochloric acid on there. You'll see that it is not fizzing. This is not reacting. So this is not made of calcite. This is a different type of rock, not some marine environment, but fast moving water. So that's sample number one. Sample number two. Relatively nondescript grayish rock. A couple of distinguishing characteristics about this is that when you run your hand, <clears throat> when you run your hands across it, it's almost soft, almost smooth, almost powdery. If I take my fingernail and I scrape off some of the sediments and you look at those on the background, 
these are very, very small, very, very powdery, very small sediments, almost microscopic. And indeed, these small microscopic sediments is what gives us an indication this would be a low energy environment rock. You look on edge, it's hard to get a sense, but you can almost see some strata there, some very fine strata in there. Here's a good shot of some of it. Very thin layers of this soft, very small sediment, probably low energy environment rock, number two. Number three, different from number two in that you can see some of the layers. <clears throat> you can see coloration, it's faint. It's harder to see on the camera, but get this horizontal banding from where the rock was deposited. And it is not smooth. Here's a better shot of the strata. It is not smooth, it is grainy and it is gritty, almost feeling like sandpaper. And close up, you can actually see all of the different sand size grains. And for the most part, the sediments in this are all about the same size. Some of them gray, some of them brown, some of them red, some of them clear, some of them tan. These are all basically the same size. And this is grainy and gritty, almost like sandpaper. All right. Number four. This is a really unique one. This is a fun one. The sediments in this almost looks like a granola bar or oatmeal. These are all little shell fragments that have been broken up, probably due to some sort of wave or tidal action, and then they've been cemented together. Really, really light in color. There we go. Turn that light off and you can see it significantly better. See the different shell fragments with the hat, all cemented together. And go ahead and use our hydrochloric acid again, just to show that this fizzes quite quickly and quite readily, giving another indication that this too is made of the mineral calcite, very frequently something that marine organisms and marine shells make their encasements and bodies out of. Number four. Number five. Black rock, shiny. You actually can see some of the layers on the edge. And it's not a whole lot to this. You're actually able to kind of write with it, so it's kind of scraping off. It's a little bit lighter in uh, weight, not particularly dense. And for some of you, this might be something that you find in your stocking. Number five. And those are the sedimentary samples. The next set of rocks that we're going to look at and sketch and try and match up are igneous rocks. These are born of fire, lava, and magma. The main distinguishing characteristic we want to look at and try and identify and crystals. 
Sample six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. Six of these. I'll show you a video of it. Sketch each of them. And then we'll look down at the names and ultimately try and match them up. In no particular order, or in alphabetical order here. Andesite porphyry. Remember what a porphyritic texture is? Kind of looks like a chocolate chip cookie. Has large crystals embedded in a fine grain matrix. Next, we're going to have a basalt. See if you can match up what a basalt is. Fine grain texture with basaltic chemistry. Means it's darker in color and rich in iron and magnesium. Next, gabbro. It's a relatively rare intrusive igneous rock. Intrusive means that it formed underground, which means that it cooled slowly, which generally means it's going to have large visible crystals. Granite should be one we're all familiar with. Granite countertops, courthouse, state capitol. Granite is a coarse grained igneous rock. It means it's also intrusive, large visible crystals, but it has a granitic chemistry. Granitic means it has a lot of quartz and a lot of feldspar, rich in silicates, which means that it is a very light colored rock is different than these two, which will be much darker in color because their chemistry is rich in iron and magnesium. These are rich in silicates. Last two, obsidian, extrusive igneous rock, meaning it formed on the surface. It's a hardened lava flow. It has no crystals. It's glassy texture, often black or brown, with sharp jagged edges. This is literally con considered volcanic glass. Lastly, pumice. Pumice is also an extrusive igneous rock that has a glassy texture, but it's a different type of glassy texture. It's called frothy glass. Pumice is volcanic foam. Obsidian doesn't have gas bubbles in it, but pumice did have gas bubbles in it when it was crystallizing and cooling. We'll now look at the igneous rock samples. Starting with sample number six. These are all rock samples that have been born out of fire, crystallized, cooled from magma underneath the surface or lava on the Earth's surface. Zoom in. And this one, number six, hard to get a sense of this, but these are small pores, holes in this rock. Number six, when you pick it up, it's actually very, very light. This is something that we would consider to be, in essence, volcanic foam. <clears throat> See if we can get this to show properly. Put this in the water and it actually floats. This is so buoyant and so fluffy, so frothy, that it actually floats in water. This is volcanic foam. Number seven. <clears throat> Number seven, it's a dark colored, you pick it up, and unlike number six, this is very dense, very heavy. It's made up of minerals and crystals that are significantly more dense. Now, one of the things on igneous rocks we want to look at is whether or not you can see crystals. And with this one, see a little bit of sparkling. Yeah. Move that in the light. Not necessarily this big thing. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about all through here. Oh. 
red shot of this. It's actually dark colored crystalline rock, namely gray in color. But it doesn't appear to have large visible crystals. Tiny granular speckles. Let's look at number eight. This is common igneous rock that you might have seen before. The edges of it are sharp. can actually cut and scratch. Stone Age times, this could be used as a tool, can be shaped and used as some sort of blade. No real visible crystals in this. Number nine. A medium to light gray colored rock, but this actually has <clears throat> large visible crystals that are darker, surrounded by fine grained matrix. These here are large, dark amphibole crystals. There's another really pretty collection of them you can see there. Those dark crystals surrounded by a fine grained matrix. That's really, really neat. Indicating that this cooled, crystallized at two different rates, two different speeds and two different locations. Again, this is sample number nine. Sample number 10. A variety of large visible crystals, many of which are lighter in color. Some pinks, some clears, some creams, and a few dark ones, but all of these are tightly interlocking crystals, indicating that these crystals had time to grow. This whole one right here is a big individual crystal. Okay. Mainly lighter in color, but a few dark ones. That light color should be an indication of the type of chemistry, whereas the others were darker in color, and that was an indication of that different chemistry. The last igneous sample. And I'm glad that the lighting, the coloring is being picked up. This indeed is a grayish, but also hint of green. One of the main minerals in this is actually called olivine. It's a very, very pretty rock, but also large visible crystals. Right. Large visible crystals of this igneous rock. So we contrast this to this and they have the same color closely. So that means their chemistries are related. Number seven here and number 11 on the right. So their chemistries are the same, but their texture is different. The one on the right has large visible crystals. The one on the left has fine microscopic granular crystals. It's a good comparison right there. The last set of rocks in the kit, 
are all metamorphic rock. These are rocks that have been changed. And we're going to see if we can determine whether or not and look for foliation. Samples 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. The five rocks are going to include anthracite, non foliated. It's a high grade metamorphic change. It's actually the highest grade of coal. The coal before it would have been bituminous coal. Generally, it's glossy, maybe a gunmetal gray, burns at a very high temperature. Next, we have gneiss. The G is silent, not gneiss, but gneiss. It's a foliated metamorphic rock. It forms when the igneous rock granite undergoes an extremely high grade metamorphic change. The banding is different from schist in that it is granular foliation, granular banding, rather than platy or flaky foliation. Main minerals are quartz and feldspar, which is the same minerals that granite was made of. Next we have marble, low to medium grade metamorphic rock, forms from the parent rock of limestone. Marble is non-foliated because the main mineral, the main crystal, is calcite. If it only has one mineral, there's really nothing to differentiate, so it's not going to form banding. Because it was made of calcite, and it's still made of calcite, it too will fizz when hydrochloric acid is placed on it. Next, schist. It's a high-grade metamorphic rock that comes from the parent rock slate. Schist has a very high percentage of mica minerals. Mica minerals are flat and flaky. So schist has a very platy foliation, also a shiny uh, foliation or a shiny texture. This platy flaky foliation contrasts with Nice's granular foliation. I mentioned that before. In addition, schist usually has a shiny or sparkly appearance, as I just mentioned. Lastly, slate. Slate is a low-grade foliated rock that comes from the parent rock shale. Shale is typically monochrome gray, relatively compact with thin platy foliation visible along the edges. Sometimes those foliations are difficult to see. But slate is a relatively nondescript rock, but it has a lot of functionality and that you can make floor tile, countertops, billiard table uh, tops. Okay. Those are the metamorphic rocks. We'll start with the metamorphic rocks now. Starting with sample number 12. Remember these are all rocks that have changed, undergone some sort of pressure or heat or both, and changed from some other rock type before. Need to look for foliation or non-foliation. Foliation is banding due to the heat and the pressure. This is sample number 12. You look at this and it's relatively nondescript. It's heavy. It is relatively dense. You look at edge. There is indication that there is some parallel alignment of here are some thin parallel alignments. I will tell you that thinking back to sedimentary rock number two, this sedimentary rock number two actually is the parent rock of this. If you remember what this one was like, soft, small grains, low energy environment. If it gets exposed to enough heat and pressure, it will be turned into this, number 12. Okay. Number 13. Beautiful rock, shiny, lots of Crystals, crystals that have grown because of the heating. If you look on edge, you can see foliation, lineations in there. The material that 13 is made out of is these flaky crystalline materials, these flat, flaky mica 
materials. And this rock has undergone substantial metamorphosis. And this will get formed when number 12 actually undergoes significant heat, almost cooking and baking and burning. So you may think those are not even close. Well, if you look at number 12, you see that it is relatively nondescript. Now imagine putting it in the oven so much that it actually burns and gets chunks forming together. That's what you get with number 13. Okay. Number 14. Another shiny, but relatively nondescript, black, silverish rock. Doesn't appear to be any foliation on this. Almost jagged edges. It turns out that number 14 is the metaphor, metamorphic result of number five being metamorphosed. Okay. Five, if it undergoes even more pressure and heat, will turn into this higher grade metamorphic rock here, number 14. Number 15. I don't think the light, yeah, the light will make it worse. This is light cream, almost white. Chances are some of you have this metamorphic rock somewhere in your house as countertop or tile. You get close enough, you can actually see how some of the materials have also been baked and cooked out. But we're looking for foliation and it appears that all of the material in this rock is identical. Remember foliation occurs when different types of minerals separate out due to the heat and pressure. I do want to show one other part to number 15 and that is if you use the hydrochloric acid on it. I know we did that with sedimentary rocks looking for calcite but if you do it with this it too fizzes, giving an indication that that rock probably came from the parent rock of zero, or maybe something similar to this one that was made up of shell fragments here. All of those fizzed and reacted to the hydrochloric acid. Last one, number 16. Beautiful. Look at the sparkles. I don't even have it focused. Look at the sparkles. Isn't that amazing? Zoom out and you can see maybe a little bit more obvious the foliation. The banding runs like this the banding that's running like this. Right. This is a high grade metamorphic rock. But unlike number 13, where the minerals were flat and flaky, this number 16 is grainy. Substantial metamorphosis and Turns out that number 16 comes from when number 10 gets metamorphosed. You can see the random assortment of crystals on number 10 on this igneous rock, but then they join together and separate out in their bands on number 16. And that's our last metamorphic sample. Okay, now that we've had the opportunity to go through and 
examine the characteristics and sketch all the rock samples, let's see if we can positively identify them. I'm going to do this relatively quickly because you already looked at them once. We're going to look at them here, and then you're going to look at them again in the last section of the lab. Right? Number zero, sample zero, if you remember. There wasn't any large particles, and its distinguishing characteristic was that it fizzed with hydrochloric acid. It's going to be this one, crystalline limestone. Chemical said rock usually forms in a shallow ocean due to organic processes, so it couldn't be that deep. You, know, you have to have sunlight for the organic processes to take place in the shallower water. Sometimes it contains fossils, can indicate an ancient environment, it's made of the mineral calcite, precipitated out of solution, usually by microorganisms. Um, so we'll put crystalline limestone. Number one had grains of a lot of different sizes, some sand, some bigger, pebble, cobble, things like that. Plastic said rock made of rounded particles of varying sizes. These form when a variety of grains get transported and deposited in areas of high energy. Generate conglomerates become lithified through cementation. The word conglomerate has a meaning more broad than even geology. A conglomerate, if you know, is a word that means a variety of different things all packed together. Number two, the grains in this were very small. Remember I scraped it off and it was very powdery. So these very small ones is going to be a low energy of deposition. Plastic said rock in areas of low energy. Sediment grains of shale off are microscopic, thin, flat and flaky, very thin strata. So this is shale. Excellent. Number three, the grainy, gritty one, made up of all sand grain sizes, kind of a dead giveaway for what it is. Sandstones are classified as clastic, also called detrital. Clastic said rocks that are always made of similar sized grains of sand. 90 to 95% of everything that's in here is quartz. Quartz is very durable. It will last as it's being weathered and transported. Number three is sandstone. Oftentimes sandstone has a high porosity and that high porosity can result in a very good amount of volume that this rock has where water can get trapped or where oil and natural gas can get trapped. Number four, this is the really unique one made up of shell fragments and it too fizzed, coquina. Alkina, cemented together shell fragments, which then lastly means number five was the low grade of lignite coal. A chemical said rock consists of fossilized lithified plant remains. All right, so we'll put that there. Alkina, there's our sandstone our shale, our conglomerate, and our crystalline limestone. And these are all sedimentary rocks, and these all tell a story of the environment in which they were deposited and the environment in which they formed. They tell a story of the energy involved with that deposition and transport, and many of them give an indication of uh, paleo life forms that were involved with those organic processes. Okay, sedimentary rocks, good job. Moving on to igneous rocks, the six different samples you had here. Number six was the one that floated because of the porosity and the pore space. Those are from gas bubbles. This is volcanic foam and that is, out of these, it's this, frothy glass, pumice. It's not compact glass. 
Tiny microscopic holes were formed as gas bubbles escaped from the cooling lava. The best analogy, if you can imagine, go to a soda fountain and get a root beer or a Dr. Pepper and the foam that's on the top of that right as you pour it out um, of the tap. If you were able to scrape off that foam, scrape off that froth and freeze it instantaneously, if you can imagine what that process would be like. That's what pumice is. It's volcanic foam. Number seven, it's the dark, fine-grained, not large crystals. Number seven, dark in color, which means it's not gonna be granitic. It's gonna be more basaltic. So bas basalt has a basaltic, gabbro has a basaltic. But basalt is fine-grained which is exactly what this is. It is basalt, right from a Hawaiian lava flow. Good. Number eight, the obsidian, that volcanic glass. Pretty straightforward. That's a relatively easy one. This formed so quickly that it didn't have time for crystals to form at all. And that's what gives it these sharp, jagged, edges that in the Stone Age could be used for working tools and creating um, useful tools for cultures. Number nine, if you remember, had the larger visible crystals embedded in a fine-grained matrix. So this is a porphyritic texture rock, and the one we have there is andesite porphyry. Number 10, number 10, large visible crystals, many of which are light in color. There are some dark ones here, not compared to 11 though. 11 is all dark crystals, okay? So these two are related in that they have similar textures, large visible crystals indicating they cool deep underground. Big crystals, indicating that they cooled over the course of a long time to allow those crystals to grow. Number 10, many more lighter colored quartzes and feldspars, pinks and whites and creams and light yellows. Um, this is a coarse grained intrusive rock, large visible crystals. Granite has granitic chemistry. It means they have very high concentration of silicates like quartz and feldspars. So number 10 is granite. And number 11, which I mentioned, compared it to the granite, but this one is made up of much darker minerals. So its chemistry is much more related to number seven, which is basalt. And in fact, it is the same type of magma. Seven would have formed on the surface 11 would have formed deep underground, and that really is the only difference, is their texture. So that means this one is gabbro, a rare intrusive igneous rock that forms when basaltic magma crystallizes below the surface. Gabbro. So there's those. Pumice, basalt, obsidian, andesite porphyry, granite, and Gabbro. One final note about the igneous rocks. Remember the two main things you're looking at are texture and the chemistry. In a simple sense, chemistry is determined loosely by the color. Darker rocks are going to be more on the basaltic end. That means they don't have a lot of silicates. They have a lot more darker, more dense elements and minerals, iron and magnesium rich, and lighter color minerals, excuse me, lighter colored rocks would be granitic in chemistry. The other thing is texture. You can have coarse grain textures. You can have combos, which is porphyritic. You can have fine grain texture, which tells the story that it formed on the surface. And then you can also have glassy textures. These also formed on the surface by cooling 
very rapidly. The coarse grained ones here would have cooled much more slowly deep underground. Metamorphic rocks, the last ones. Let's look at these, starting with sample 12. This is this relatively plain, nondescript rock. A little bit of foliation, some lineations you should see, you could see here. I'm looking at 12, look down here. Slate is a low grade foliated rock that comes from the parent rock shale, typically gray, relatively compact with thin platy foliations along the edges. Slate, 13. Here is number 13. This shiny rock that looks like it's pinned through the grinder, platy, flaky foliations looking on edge. You can see a lot of the sparkles in there. Those are micas, those are mica crystals. Schist, high grade metamorphic change, very high percentage of mica. We call it have platy, it can be sparkly. Just 14. Highest grade of the fossil fuel, coal. There's no foliation in this. This would come from, originally from a swamp, but it would have gone through stages of swamp and then peat moss and then lignite coal and then bituminous coal and finally anthracite coal. Number 15, remember this one, non-foliated, it's made up of all the same colored crystals. It fizzed when we put hydrochloric acid on it, a great indication that it is calcite. Calcite came from limestone. Limestone, when it's metamorphosed, is marble. Last but not least, number 16. You can see the foliation in it. This one is granular foliation as opposed to the flaky foliation of the schist, number 13. Number 16 has high grade metamorphic change. It was originally granite. It was originally this right here, but it has since been metamorphosed and it has turned into this. Nice. The G is silent, but you can always remember that G goes to G. Granite metamorphoses into gneiss, and S goes to S. Shale goes to slate, and slate goes to schist. G to G, and S to S to S. All right. Hopefully you had the chance to um, identify several of those and hopefully you were quite successful at that. Remember, metamorphic rocks, you are looking at foliation or non-foliation, trying to determine and see what sort of story these would tell from whether it was low grade metamorphic change or high grade metamorphic change. Okay, now that we've had the chance to identify all the rocks, kind of transition to part two of the lab. These do not match up with any of the rock samples we did. These are specific to these cross sections here. For each of the diagrams, select the best choice for what type of rock would form in each of the labeled locations. In other words, predict what type of rock would actually form in these locations. Number one, pointing to underground, igneous pluton. In other words, this is a big blob of magma that is ultimately going to cool and crystallize underneath the ground. An example of this would be granite. So what would that be? It's certainly not sedimentary or sedimentary. Those occur on the surface. And you have intrusive and extrusive. Inside is obviously Intrusive, good. Number two, here's another igneous intrusion right here, but this is pointing next to it. This is already solid rock. 
An example of this would be schist. This isn't the magma itself. We can rule out sedimentary because it's not on the surface. It's not the magma, so it's not going to be igneous or igneous. If you remember, schist is a type of metamorphic rock. So this heat in this deep burial depth is going to cause a high-grade foliation. So that would be foliated metamorphic. Good. Next. Look here, see a mountain range, you see a drainage basin, a river. It's hard to see, but this is a coastline draining out to the ocean, huh? pointing to this river. So water on the surface, an example would be a conglomerate. Remember conglomerate is a type of sedimentary. So we want to look at, it's not igneous, it's not igneous. Is it clastic sedimentary or chemical sedimentary? If you remember, chemical sedimentary is more likely to be out in the ocean with limestone and things like that, and we're talking about conglomerate. So it is clastic sedimentary. Excellent. Number four. Again, it looks like we have a river basin here pointing to different levels of deposition here in the drainage plane. So we're on the surface again. An example would be shale. So you can cross out igneous. It's certainly not igneous. We're dealing with fresh water, not out in the ocean. That is going to be what? Shale is a clastic sedimentary rock. Number five. See volcanoes, magma chamber here. Number five is pointing to this lava flow here. An example would be basalt, a basaltic lava flow. Should be pretty straightforward. What is that? On the surface, extrusive igneous. Number six. This is canyon, water cutting through these layers. An example of it would be sandstone. Remember your sandstone, made up of particles that are all basically sand grain size. Surface processes, so that is clastic sedimentary. Good. Back to this one pointing to the magma chamber deep underground that's fueling these volcanoes. Example would be gabbro, or what gabbro is. It's a large crystals formed underground. So that's going to be igneous intrusive. Excellent. Number eight pointing to a tectonic region where you have one plate colliding with another plate, one plate being subducted under another, and intense forces, intense uh, pressures. Example would be nice here, high grade change. So what do we have? Foliated metamorphic. Number nine and number ten. Again, here's tectonic boundaries colliding. We have a convergent plate boundary. It's hard to see, but this is the coastline. This is pointing out to the ocean. Example would be limestone deposited here offshore. This is land here. This is ocean water. That's the beach. So deposited just offshore, limestone, sediments getting deposited in the ocean basin, and that is B, chemical sedimentary rock. Number 10, pointing to these igneous intrusions, an example would be diorite, magma rising up because of the tectonic boundary, 
diorite is a intrusive igneous rock. Excellent. That's part B of the or the second part of the rock types and rock formations lab, predicting what type of rocks will form in those locations. The final part of this lab is going to be reviewing all six sedimentary, all six igneous, and all five metamorphic rocks with some of their characteristics and properties in table form. Looking at sample zero, if you remember, this was the crystalline limestone. <clears throat> and for the sedimentary, we're going to categorize them as clastic or chemical, organic or inorganic, already listed for you, high energy or low energy environment of deposition. Remember, the energy of deposition is a direct function of the sediment size and the sediment grains. All right, limestone, <clears throat> clastic or chemical. Well, if it's limestone, it is going to generally involve biological processes, so that is chemical. And looking at this one in particular, the grains on this are very small. Um, so if you have small sediments being deposited, what does that mean for deposition? That's low energy. Number one, this was the conglomerate, which you have large particles. I know these aren't giant, but compared to the mud sized particles from the limestone, these larger grains, pebble and cobble, um, was the conglomerate. Conglomerate is what? It is clastic. And with these particles that are of varying sizes, some of them large, these would not be able to be moved by wind. You would need fast moving water. So it's high energy deposition. So the limestone was organic. The conglomerate is inorganic. Number two is the shale. Remember tiny, tiny, tiny microscopic particles. So if we start with that, tiny, tiny, tiny microscopic particles, the only way those will settle out is if they're low energy. And shale, if you remember, is typically inorganic and therefore going to be also clastic, not chemical. Number three, remember it was the sand grain sizes, very grainy. Um, this is our sandstone. And sandstone is a clastic sedimentary rock, sand grains. And sand generally needs moving water, either river or downslope. So surprisingly, might not be as high energy as you think, but sand is a high energy environment rock. Number four. Remember this one also fizzed with HCl, made up of the shell fragments. Calcina, it's organic, it fizzed, so it's a type of limestone, so that means it's chemical. And these shell fragments being um, broken up, ultimately cemented together on a beach somewhere, wave action, what do you call that wave action? High energy. Lastly, number five, the lignite coal. Lignite coal is from a swamp. You're looking on edge, you can see some of the small strata. And what is a swamp like? Is it high energy or low energy? What is the water like in a swamp? It's 
very stagnant, it's organic, biological from the swamp. Oops. So that is going to be low energy. Good, moving on to igneous rocks. Number six, if you remember, floated in water. This was pumice. Intrusive or extrusive? These gas bubbles here, these holes, show you that it was a foam or a froth, and gas bubbles can only escape when you're on the surface. So that's extrusive. What sort of texture is this? It's certainly not coarse, doesn't have big visible crystals. Fine grain, no, it doesn't have microscopic crystals. It's not porphyritic, it doesn't have big and fine grain crystals. Pumice is a type of glass, it's called frothy glass. So this is glassy. And oftentimes because of that high gas content, what is its chemistry? What is the chemistry of pumice? More often than not, it is granitic. Huh? So again, looking at these four here, for igneous rocks, we got the name, whether it's intrusive or extrusive. Whether it's intrusive or extrusive also determines its texture. So these are related very much. And then the type of chemistry. Moving on to number seven. Remember what this was? This was basalt. You turn the light on there. And you can see some of the microscopic crystals here. Remember what basalt is? Basalt is from lava flows, just like on Hawaii. So it is extrusive. This type of texture is one, because it's on the surface and cooled more rapidly, we would call that fine grained. And it's basalt. So what type of chemistry do you think it is? It's certainly basaltic. Yeah, no tricks by the geologist. If you have a basalt rock, it has a basaltic chemistry. Number eight, if you remember, was obsidian. And this is technically called volcanic glass. It has the sharp edges there. And if it's glass, cooled very rapidly, so that's extrusive. Since it's volcanic glass, it has a glassy texture. And obsidian can have any of those, but often it doesn't have a lot of gas in it. So it's not uncommon for obsidian to have an andesitic chemistry. But it could have basaltic or granitic. Number nine, remember this one? Had the large visible um, horn blend crystals. Beautiful crystals here. Inside the fine grain, lighter gray matrix. This was what was called the andesite porphyry. Oops. Andesite porphyry. Intrusive or extrusive? Both intrusive and extrusive. Texture, obviously porphyritic. And it's the andesite porphyry, so obviously andesitic. The name of porphyritic rocks gives away exactly what they are. Moving on to number 10. If you remember this, it was lighter in color. Uh -huh. Many quartz feldspar crystals here, and a much smaller amount of darker hornblende and mica crystals. So those lighter colors, I'll start over on this side, would be granitic, lighter in color. Number 10 is granite, intrusive or extrusive, large visible crystals that cooled at depth slowly over the course of years, maybe hundreds of years. Intrusive, 
and that is coarse grain texture. Coarse grain texture. Lastly, number 11. Beautiful gabbro with the black, dark gray, and olive green crystals. Those olive green crystals are actually called olivine. Olivine is generally found only in, focus there, only found in basaltic chemistry. So gabbro, basaltic, how would you describe its texture? Big visible crystals. So it cooled slowly to get those big crystals. And if it cooled slowly, where did it cool? Inside or outside? Interior or exterior? Had to have been intrusive. Excellent, very good. Let's finish up with the metamorphic. Number 12 was slate. Real fine grain, um, low grade foliated rock. So slate, its parent rock is shale. It is indeed foliated. It's not as obvious as some of the other ones, but it is a low grade metamorphic change. And again, that came from shale, which was that. Look at number two. There's our shale. There's our slate. After burial and change, you go from this, which was a low grade, or excuse me, a low energy sedimentary rock to a low grade change metamorphic rock. Look at number 13. 13 is schist shiny, mica-rich, flaky mineraled rock. It indeed is foliated, and that is a high-grade metamorphic change. Huh? Like it's just been through the ringer. 14, its parent rock was bituminous coal. 14, its parent rock was bituminous coal, and 14 was anthracite coal, the highest grade of coal. This would burn very hot and very, very clean compared to other fossil fuels. It's only made of one thing, so it doesn't have any foliation, and it is the highest grade of coal, so it would be a high grade metamorphic change. 15. Remember this is marble. Marble comes from limestone. There's no banding in this. It's all made up of one mineral calcite. So non-foliated. And it's a low to medium metamorphic change. And like I said, it comes from limestone. Lastly, nice, literally. Metamorphic rock that came from granite. You can always remember G from G. Granite turns into gneiss after a very high grade metamorphic change. And remember looking at this one, what do you think? Does it have banding? Yes. It's a foliated high grade change of the parent granite turned into gneiss. Okay, there was a lot to this lab. You do not need to write a separate conclusion for it. Just paste in all the pages. Make sure that all of your samples have been drawn and colored and sketched. Make sure that the front of the lab is filled in. You have them all drawn and you've identified them and that you've finished the rock formation cross sections along with the data tables at the back. Great job. There was a lot to it. Thanks for watching.